quick question for you. Uh, I asked one of our members this earlier. Just want to see, you know, how how much, how many of you um, read your Bibles on a regular basis. Okay. Does anyone know how old Jesus was when he was born? Yes. when he died. <laughs> okay. Well, it is somewhat of a trick question. I'll say somewhat, okay. Hmm? So? Right, he was ageless. Right? Because according to the Gospel of John, who was here first? Hmm? Uh, according to the Gospel of John, who was here first? Hmm? And who, what, who was the Word? What do you call the word? Did anybody read John? The Gospel of John? It says, in the beginning was, and the word was what? And now it says, the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Right? Everything was made by him, right? Nothing that was made by him that was not made by him. Right? But then it says something else about the word. Does it? Verse 14 says what? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So who was that? So if that's Jesus, what does verse 1 say? If the word is Jesus, verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word. Right? So verse 1 says that Jesus is without age because he's always been existing. Okay, all right, we move on. <laughs> Let's see that now. I hope none of you all are on Jeopardy and they ask this question. Okay? All right. Just a little something to make you think. That's all. Okay? All right. We're in Philippians 1. So um, let's uh, bow our heads and look to the Lord. Lord, our Father and our God, once again we have assembled ourselves under the direction of your Holy Spirit, seeking, Father, a better understanding of your word so that we may be able to live our lives in a way that will be pleasing in your sight. Master, on this hour, we pray for strength, we pray for perseverance, we pray for wisdom, and we pray, God, that we will use every opportunity that you give us so that someone else will know how wonderful a God we serve. And we thank you for this night. We thank you for blessing us with this moment in time that we may learn of your will, your ways, and that we may grow so that we can be better as we walk upon this earth. We thank you for our life and also for the grace and mercy that you have blessed us to be a part of. And we ask these blessings and lift up this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're in Philippians chapter 1, and uh, we're starting on verse 22. Are there any questions about anything we have covered so far that we might need to go back and clarify? Any questions? Okay. 
All right, then we will go ahead and jump right in at verse 22. Verse 22, 23, and 24 uh, are verses that, you know, we can look at together as one, one thought. And here's what that says. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful uh, for you. So what Paul is addressing here is a comment that he has made to the, to the, to the Philippians about whether or not it is more beneficial to die or to live. When you think about death, when human beings think about death, the irony of all Christians that I know is that we act as if death is such a horrible thing, okay? And even though we say we don't believe that, even though we say we love the Lord and, and we don't always like to admit it, here's why we know that people who that are Christians view death as a horrible thing. When someone dies that you know, when someone dies and the person that is either a family member or close to them is yet alive, what do you normally do when you meet that person? I'm sorry for your loss, right? I want to send my condolences. I'm not telling you not to do that, all right? I'm not saying not to send condolences because we live in an imperfect world where if you don't send condolences, where if you don't say I'm sorry for your loss, people get upset with you. But the irony of it is, is this. How many of you would say I'm sorry for your loss if I inherited a billion dollars and moved to the island of my choice? How many of you would see one of my sisters and say, I'm so sorry that your brother inherited a billion dollars and moved to the island of his choice? Would anyone think that way? Would you think that I send my condolences? Or would you just think, you know what? You would have thought your brother had a billion dollars, would have had enough love in his heart to take you with him to the island, wouldn't you? Okay, so how then do we view heaven? Do we view heaven as a nice place or a bad place? Do we really believe there is a heaven? Right? We say we do, but Paul says if we say we do, then we think backwards. Right? Because if you think back to verse 21, he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right? He says, I'd be better off if I die, I will benefit. If I live, I'm going to still be tortured on this earth. And he said that because He's letting you know and letting us know that his ministry in serving Christ was not going to be one without trial and tribulation. Okay? Now, many of you who have elected to serve Christ with all your mind, body, heart, and soul can testify that even though it may be an honorable thing to do, it doesn't come without some difficulty. Right? Because folks tend to get more Hellacious when you're trying to get more sanctified, right? So what Paul says then in those verses that we just went over, he says that, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I don't, I want not. I mean, what I'm not quite clear on what I ought to do. Because he's saying, listen, I want to keep working to get your behind saved. But I'm really tired of messing with you because I have worked hard and I really want to go home and be with Jesus. So I'm struggling, I'm struggling to ask God to either let me come home with him or stay down here with you all. And that's why he says in verse 24, nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So he's saying what? If I keep living, it helps you, it doesn't help me, right? If you think about it in that context, right? And if we can think about it in that context, 
it ought to change the way we view people when they die. I mean, it ought to. I'm not saying it will. I'm saying, but it ought to, right? Because if I really believe that heaven is what I'm striving for, and everyone in here say sanctify I got a little Holy Ghost in Everybody got just a little Holy Ghost in All right. So that means everybody in here is striving to get to heaven, right? I mean, that's what you're living for, to get to heaven. Isn't it odd that you're living to get to heaven, and then when you get there, folk mad at you. Not mad, I'm sorry. Sad that you got there. You know, people look at it as a negative rather than a positive. I mean, we know the Bible tells us what? Mourn at the birth, right? And celebrate at the death. How is it that we can think that everything else in the Bible is good except that concept? Okay? Because if one of you all died and I didn't show up at y'all funeral, I mean, of course, you wouldn't know it because you'd be dead, right? But, but, but the rest of the folk would be like, I can't believe that Pastor Daniels didn't come to the funeral and preach that eulogy. He didn't even show up. He was somewhere having a good time. Right? But isn't that what we were told to do? Right? It, what did Jesus tell us to do? He said what? Let the, bury, let the dead bury the dead. Come on, do what I told you to do. Follow me. Right? So all Paul is doing is reiterating what Jesus said and what Solomon said and what our Heavenly Father has taught us that your goal should be to come back home. So Paul is saying that it's better for me to die than to stay down here and keep on working. Okay? Now, so, so, so here's what I want you to do when I die. Because I want you to be right, I want God to be happy when I die with you all. Okay? Here's what I want you to do. There are some people that I've already commissioned to cry. Okay? They know who they are. Okay? They know to fall out. They know to do everything they're supposed to do. They know that y'all gonna look at them and say, wait a minute. Now wait a minute, they're crying a little bit more than this wife crying. What's going on around here? Okay? But know this, that's just because they are acting. Okay? Now for the rest of you all, I want you all to celebrate. Okay? Celebrate that I lived. Celebrate that you know what? I'm going home to be with Jesus. All right? So you can come in here and have the traditional funeral so that other folk won't think y'all lost your mind that I didn't teach you right. But then, rather than having a reception where everybody's sitting around and whoa, and he was this and he was that, no. I want y'all to throw a slamming party. I want y'all to sell. Can I put you in charge of that? I want y'all to throw a slamming party, all right? Okay? Hey, just have a good old time, all right? Let's sell some tickets if you want to. I don't care. We just gonna sell some tickets. Oh, you gonna sell some dinners? Oh, oh, I thought you said you gonna sell some tickets. I was like, who? But listen, if you can sell some tickets and raise some money for the building fund, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's what he says, you know, and, 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 and that's, that really is a true statement, you know what I'm saying? Is that we have to look at things a little differently, you know, that, that it is not meant for us to enjoy being here. Because if you enjoy being here too much, you're going, you, don't, you don't want to go to heaven. You think this is where you want to be. So, verse 25. And 26, here's what he says. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So Paul says to them, hey, listen, I am a firm believer in what I'm telling you about my relationship to you and to heaven. And that I know that I'm, I will be better if I'm not here. And, and why does he tell them that? Remember where he's at when he's writing the letters. Right? He's, he's trying to let them know that, listen, my being incarcerated is not a bad thing. Because even if I don't come and see you again, listen, it'll be because I'm with Jesus now. 
That's a good thing, okay? But he's also saying, it doesn't mean I don't want to come see you. It's just that, it, you know, things are like they are, okay? Everybody comfortable with that so far? All right. 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So Paul says, no matter what happens in your life, what I'm asking you to do is to be an example that you are in Christ. Okay? He says, I want your conversation to mirror your testimony. Okay? I want you to talk like you're saved, walk like you're saved, and act like you're saved, so folk will know you're saved. That's just straightforward stuff, isn't it? Is it easy? Yes, it is. Why, why, why do you say it's not easy to walk like you're saved, talk like you're saved, and act like you're saved? Well, right, if you let the devil get in the details, you're right. Absolutely, good point. So, but how easy is it to keep the devil out of the details? Hmm? No, it's not. I gave you all the ammunition you need to keep the devil out of the details. What's the first thing you do to keep the devil out of the details? Say it again. That's right. We watch who you talk to and watch who you listen to. That's the first thing to get the devil out of the details. Right? And why is that so important? Because some of y'all be talking to the devil. That's why y'all upset. Because you're talking to the devil. Or you're talking to someone who is influenced by the devil. But if you pay attention to who you're dealing with, it won't happen to you. Follow what I'm saying? It's really just, just that simple. How do you know when you're talking to somebody being influenced by the devil? Say again? Absolutely. So if I know in your first sentence that you are being influenced by the devil, why do I stay there and argue with you? I should not, but that's what we do. Because the Bible says what? Agree with your adversary quickly. Okay? That will shut the devil up in his tracks. I don't care what the devil say to you. You say, you know what, you probably are right. The devil say, you ain't saved. You might be right. I don't know. I'm going on my faith. But you're right. I might not be, but my faith tells me I am. Okay? And I just walk away. Right? Okay, what happened? Question? No. They can't walk away. <laughs> not, not before you cuss. Right. Yeah. In the middle. In the middle of cursing. I got you. All right. yeah. But that's all. You know, that's really, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week, right? Everyone should, everyone should carry themselves so that people will say you got home training, right? Chapter 2 focuses on that more than anything, all right? Because when you tell people you are a Christian, right, you're telling them that you are Christ-like, right? That's what Christian means, to be Christ-like, right? So if I'm telling people I'm Christ-like, then doesn't it kind of, am I not lying when my conversation is not Christ-like, when my actions are not Christ-like? Because if I tell you that, then I have an obligation to act that way. Right? Or at least put that point out there to, to you. And so all Paul is saying is act like you said you were. So that's how people will perceive you. Now, if you remember what we said before, right, that you have to practice acting that way. If you don't, and you have to what? Be prepared. We talk about putting on the armor and all this kind of stuff. Put, you know, have your feet shot with the preparation of peace. 
Meaning what? You have, to have, you have to prepare yourself ahead of time so it is not something that happens at the spur of the moment. Because everyone in here knows those people that you have to deal with on a daily basis that are influenced by the devil. Am I right or wrong? You know who on your job is influenced by Satan? You know who in your household is influenced by Satan, right? Now, how many times have you, knowing that someone in your household or someone in your, 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 your circle of people that you know is influenced by Satan, so you make up in your mind and you start practicing how you're going to put them in their place, right? Don't we do that all the time? We already prepare to put them in their place. Well, if we can prepare to put them in their place, why can't we prepare to give them peace? And that's what Paul says, right? If we're going to be around people and walk in that way, we have to prepare ourselves for the person ahead of time because you know how they're going to act. So prepare yourself to absorb what they dish out so you y'all know you, you all familiar with the, the term rope a dope? What does rope a dope mean? Does anybody know? Yes. Well, okay. <laughs> almost rope a dope meant that Ali was going to lay on the ropes and let George Foreman punch him until he lost all of his strength. That's what he meant by he was going to rope a dope. He was going to lean on the ropes and let George Foreman keep punching him. And once George Foreman had punched him out, so he punched him when he was tired, then Ali knocked him out. Okay? Because Ali said, I will prepare myself for what you bring to me. So in his, when he was sparring with people, he let them hit him a lot so he could get used to the hits. Okay? Paul says something similar is that if you know people are going to act a certain way, prepare yourself ahead of time for the blows they're going to throw at you. Okay? The way you rope a dope is not by knocking them out with your fists, but the way you rope a dope is by taking everything they give to you and then just saying, well, okay. Because nothing will get a dope more upset than when you just say, okay, that's fine. Once they give you everything they got, and it appears that it does not do anything to cause you anxiety. It messes them up. Okay? Now, if you don't believe me, will you believe the Bible? Okay, so then let's move on then. Okay? When he says what? Let your conversation be what? As we come up the gospel of Christ. In 28 he says, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. So what he says is, when he says, and in nothing terrified by your adversary, he said no matter what they bring to you, you, are, you should act like it means nothing. Because when you get all flustered, that becomes a weapon for them. Okay? That's why he says, which is to them an evident token of perdition. An evident token means what? When someone is bringing stuff to you and you show them that it bothers you, now they, now they have the evidence that what they did worked. That they truly did confuse you. They truly have got you angry. They truly have gotten under your skin. So he's saying, don't let them do that. And if you don't let them do that, to you, it will be a demonstration of your salvation and that God still has you. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. So Paul says, hey, listen, when you got saved, did anyone promise you that the devil would stop putting people in your path to bring you down? 
Did anyone tell you that because you were going to heaven, that all of a sudden you wouldn't have any bills to pay? Did anybody tell you that when you got saved and joined Enoch Baptist Church, that your family would stop acting like fools? No, they didn't tell you that, did they? And so what Paul says to them is this. He said, listen, you call yourself a Christian. To be Christian is to be Christ-like. If you're Christ-like, wouldn't it make sense to you that you would also have to be crucified? Because if you're Christ-like, you have to do what he did. Now, they may not nail you to a cross, but you will probably feel like they nailed you to the cross. So he's saying, listen, you might as well accept that that's what's going to happen to you. Okay? But when it does happen, he's saying, don't let them see that it bothers you. Just like when Christ was on the cross. Did he give the indication that it was so terrible a thing? No. He said what? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then he ends by saying this, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be of me. He's saying, listen, you know that I went through the same stuff that you might go through. You know everything I went through. He said that you heard about all the turmoil that I have been going through. And if I'm writing you this letter telling you it don't bother me, then you should be able to do the same thing and say it doesn't bother you either and be willing to go through some stuff. Because it is only when all of us can demonstrate what it is to be a Christian that we will truly be doing what God wants us to do as Christians. And what is the primary thing that God wants you to do as a Christian? And why does he want you to show love? Okay, the answer that I got was he wants you to show love because he is love. Is that what the Bible says is why he wants you to show love? Hmm? Well, you're right. It, it ain't. <laughs> she said it's probably not. And she's right. It's not. So, 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 so it's, it's true what? That God is love according to the scripture. Yes. He wants you to love him because he first loved you. Why does he want you to show love to that gentleman sitting beside you right there? And why does he want you to be more like him? You're right, you're supposed to be. You gave me a circular answer. I want you to give me the answer. Yes, because you are a Christian. But why does he want you to show her love why does he say, why does he say this? Love your enemies. Why does he say, even the heathen loves those that love him? Say again. To say the second part. He said to save them. And how does showing love save them? That's the whole chapter, eh? He wants you to show love, why? So that people will want to be like you. Right? That's what we are supposed to be. Examples to the world. But why, is it, why does anybody want you to be an example? Right, so you can win them over somehow. If people see... Okay, think about yourself before you got this involved in the church, right? And none of us were this involved in the church all of our life, right? But how many of you knew about church when you were, you know, a, a, a kid? Okay, most of us did, right? Tell me why you weren't this involved in the church when you were 18 or 20 or 25. No, no, tell me honestly why you weren't involved in church. Because they had to do a thing that you knew it. Huh?
Okay, well, you know, the, yes, my dear. And so, 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 with that in mind, what does that suggest to you? Why didn't you know God? Because you was around folk that said they knew God. The reason why you didn't know God is because their lifestyle was not such that you saw God in them. Right? Because if all people did was dog you out for your clothes, dog you out for your lipstick and your makeup, that wasn't showing love. Because if you show love, you don't really feel bad. Right. A bunch of no's is not... How many no's do you read in, in the Gospels? You read, what, you, you read some, some less do. And even the no's are there to protect you. Right? So the, the bottom line is this. If people in the church... If you think about this, people on the corner show love. Now, I'm not saying they are perfect people, but they show love. How do they show love? Let's face it. Let's, is everybody, everybody in here grown, right? Everybody watching me grown, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, now, when you, come, when you first came to church, how many people shared things with you that were valuable? See, nobody raised their hand. Think about when you were in the street. There were people that you met, that shared things with you that were valuable. You didn't buy your first joint, did you? Some, right, somebody shared it with you. You didn't buy your first drink of liquor. Somebody shared it with you, right? Even though it might have been valuable to them, they shared it with you. The average alcoholic that's on the street homeless will share a drink with another alcoholic that's on the street homeless. They'll share the box that they sneak in, but the Christian won't share the living room and they can have a 10 million room house. Right? See, the people on the street don't judge you. Right? You went to the club, and you met somebody in the club, right? And you knew them for 45 minutes. And you told your girlfriends, hey, look here, I got my ride home. <laughs> right? And the next day, they didn't judge you. They just said, hey, what happened? You all right? Was he, was he as good as he looked? And if you said, he sure was, because, oh, my God, has he got a brother? That's what you were saying. Right? See, they didn't judge you. People in the church do what? They judge you all the time. I mean, if you wore some clothes to the club that showed you was a hoochie mama, they laughed at you behind your back, but they didn't judge you so much. They didn't tell you to get out of the club. You can't wear that stuff in here. If you wore a dress down to your ankles in the club, nobody said, you can't come in this club looking all holy fire. Did they? But if you come in the church with a real short dress on, you can't wear that up in here. This is the church. Even though we told you to what? Come as you are. Right? See, the thing that the, 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 the point then is if we would show the kind of love, it would attract more people to Christ. That's why the Bible tells us we should always show love and always walk like a child of God so we can attract other people to wanting to become children of God. The more we show that, the more they'll want to be where we are. Okay? Everybody good? Okay, so that means you, y'all gonna stop judging now? Right? You not? Well, at least you're honest about it. <laughs> try, anyway. I know you ain't gonna stop overnight, but try. Okay? Now, you can still joke on people, but just don't judge them. Any questions about chapter one? All right, let's go to chapter two. I like chapter two personally. For several reasons, as you'll see as we're going down it. All right? Paul says, if there be any, if there be therefore any consolation 
in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. I love that. I haven't seen it yet in practice, but I love it. Right? If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if there's anything about being a child of God through Christ that makes you happy, okay? If there be any comfort of love, if God's adoration and his love and sacrifice for you has given you any sense of well-being and comfort, if any fellowship of the Spirit that you've ever been drawn together because of the Spirit of the living God, if any vows of mercy, if God has ever gave you mercy rather than justice, okay, here's what he says. Fulfill ye my joy. He's making a personal plea. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. My God, my God. I am in the position that Paul is in but I have never experienced what he espouses in these two verses. If we all could be like-minded, having the same love on one accord, wouldn't it be so wonderful if the whole body of Christ could be on one accord? I would be overjoyed if Enoch could be on one accord. I would be overjoyed if the Bible study could be on one accord. Okay? I'm, I'm telling you. Think about this. We all serve the same God, right or wrong. We all are baptized by the same Spirit, right or wrong. We all have been saved by grace through the blood of Jesus Christ, right or wrong. Then isn't it kind of odd that we don't see the necessity of having the same mindset when it comes to the work of God? Think about that for a minute. Think about the the inability of church folk, and I'm going to talk about Enoch church folk now. Think about the inability of Enoch church folk to come together as one unit. As one unit. Okay? As one. Can you imagine what the Enoch church would be like if everybody in the church came together to process every goal that we laid out? Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about when I say like-minded, okay? The founder of Enoch Baptist Church was not me. For those of you who don't know that, it was not me. It was Dr. Ernest Walton. He founded a church in 1961 in East Ghent in the city of Norfolk, okay? Now, I became the second pastor, but I'm also this, I am the longest serving pastor. Even though he founded the church, I've been the pastor longer than he was the pastor, okay? Now, Reverend Walton said to me one time, there are no bad ideas. That's what he said. There are no N-O bad ideas. And I'd be willing to bet you some of you will come up with ideas and tell me that that's a bad idea. But he said there are no bad ideas. He said there are only bad supporters of the idea. Do you get that? He said if everybody support anything you say do, it would be a success if they all support it. And how do we know that that's true? 
based on the Bible. Say it again. I, absolutely. I, mean, I heard you. I just want you to say it again. <laughs> right. Now, what does he mean when he said the Tower of Babel? They all, they, listen, here's what they did. They were like-minded. Everybody had the same goal. And what was the goal? Not to be flooded. Why? They had come out of the flood, and Nimrod said, hey, listen, God ain't going to kill us again with water. We're going to build a tower so high that when the flood comes, everybody just climb up. Right? And God himself, so they had one goal, right? They were like-minded. They had one voice. They had communication, lateral and vertical, right? The only thing they did not have was what? They had good sense. <laughs> well, they, well, it depends on how you look at it. But their idea was a good idea. Because they did not know what? What you know. They weren't thinking about that God wanted to kill everybody. They were just thinking he ain't going to kill me. Right? So what they didn't understand was what they were doing was not in the will of God. Okay? But yet and still, God himself said, that these people are of one voice, they are one mind, and nothing they imagine will be impossible unto them. That's what God said, right? Now, if God told us that, doesn't that suggest that if we are like-minded, that there's nothing that we could not do collectively? And the reason that we don't do stuff is because we are not like-minded. There's always somebody that's saying, that's not a good idea. Just because they did not think of it. It's always, and not, not just in this church, but you're doing it in your own family life. Right? There's some folk, if they are not the ones that put the idea forward, they won't support it. Right? Because they want to be the ones to get all the credit. Okay? If we could have a like-minded church, we would, I would be such a joyful pastor. Let me tell you something. See, if we had a like-minded church, I wouldn't have to work hard at all to make y'all happy. Can I give you an easy example of what I'm talking about? Let's say all, let's say everybody that came to church had a like mind that we're going to praise God. Just, just, just that one simple concept. When we come to church, we're going to praise God, right? When you come to church, do you want to sit in a church that seems dead? No. You want to sit in a church that seems like what? The spirit is high, don't you? Yeah. Well, what makes that happen? You all do. But what if all you, what if all you all came to church every Sunday and said to yourself, you know what? We are going to praise God. And you said it every Sunday. I don't care how you felt, you said, we're going to praise God. So every Sunday, you practiced it on Saturday night. Saturday night, you practice your shout. You practice your hallelujah. You practice your amen. I know what some folks think, but wait a minute, Pastor. Wouldn't that be disingenuous if we practice it? Ain't it what some of y'all were thinking? You won't? Nobody was thinking that? I know somebody was. I ain't crazy. More than you were thinking that. But it wouldn't be disingenuous. Why? How many of you all think you should give God the best that you have? How can you give God your best if you never practice? You can't. Because it will be the first time you did. But if you practice it, you can give him your best. Right? So all I'm saying is that if we were all on one accord, Every Sunday would be the best Sunday you've ever experienced. Because you would come in here not waiting on me to preach you happy. You would come in here not waiting on the choir to sing your song. You would come in here with a mindset that when that choir sings, I'm singing too. That I'm going to get on fire. Because what? 
I came from, I'm coming to praise my God. Right? Now, in the Old Testament, did they have instruction on how to praise their God? Yes, they did, right? So if they, and they went by those directions, didn't they? So then why is it that we feel uncomfortable using the same kind of direction to praise our God? Unless the pastor tell you to. Now, if I, if I come out here and say, can I get an amen? Then you like, amen. <laughs> ain't a real amen, but it's an amen. <laughs> so I'm just saying, if everyone had that one thing where we were like-minded, how many of you all want to see the church grow? Think about how many folks talk about the church who want to see the church grow. You get where I'm coming from? If you dog out somebody else in the church, then you can't expect the church to grow. See, the only way the church grows is if you lift up everybody in the church and tell people how wonderful the church is, how wonderful everything is. Then people want to come. But if you say to folk, listen, we've got a wonderful church, but <laughs> some of these folk are crazy. So listen, see this girl right here? Don't talk to her. Because she wants your husband to talk to her. See this guy over here? He ain't nothing but a hound dog. So if he asks you for your number, don't get it out. Okay. See, when we do that, we're not what? On one accord, lifting up the church and the body of Christ. Am I making sense to you? Okay. So we want to be like-minded, right? He says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but let every man also on the things of others. It's always the wrong people sitting in church when you're teaching. I don't mean wrong that you all you ain't good people. I mean the folk that need it the most is they are never here. Okay. Because the selfish folk at home right now. Okay. You know, the, the, the essence of what it is to be a servant of God is the idea that others come before you, right? And that's what he's saying, right? Is that everything you do for God, one thing, number one, he said, whatever you do for God, don't do it so you will get glory and credit out of it. That's what that vain glory means, okay? <laughs> Vain glory. Now, but in lowliness of mind, esteem other better than yourself. Right? Lowliness of mind meaning what? That I recognize that I am just filthy rags saved by grace. And even though you are filthy rags saved by grace too, I realize that what? You are better than I am. Because, see, I know my foolishness, but I don't know all yours. So what I know is I'm worse than you. And you know you're worse than me. Why? Because you don't know all my faults, but you know all your faults. And Paul is saying that's how we ought to view each other. So if I view you that way, I'm always going to see you better than I see myself. Right? Okay? And if I see you that way, should it not change how I treat you? It should, if I really heartfelt see you that way. If everything I do, I do not for my own glory, but for the glory of God, that means I don't need a bunch of patting on the backs. You know, I cannot tell you how many times people have come up to me and say, well, Pastor Daniels, you know, you didn't say nothing about what we did last week. You ain't mentioned from the pool pit, you know, X, Y, and Z, and I be thinking, well, should I really stop every time somebody do something and give them a pat on the back? It, 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 it becomes too much. That's why I stopped. Um, some of you all don't know this, but when we first came over here, even before we got in this building, 
We used to give people a moment to testify. Remember that sister, sister, um, uh, you know who you are, okay? <laughs> Getting old ain't no joke, I'm telling you right now. Okay. Um, Mitchell, thank you, thank you. Margie Mitchell, thank you. Grace. Okay. We used to let folks testify. Right, they would get up and pass kind of we'll go ahead and testify. All right. Now this how it started out, people talking about how good God is. How the Lord did this, the Lord did that. By the time we got over here, folk were testifying like this. Well, a pastor, you know, my wife, she got an award at work. Oh, thank you, Jesus. She got an award at work for doing so this and doing this and doing this, and I'm just so proud of her. I don't know, what kind of testimony is that? <laughs> Uh, my child did this, or then someone would get them testify. You know, uh, I, I know so and so and so, brother so and so needed some needed some food, and and uh, you know, and um, and the Holy Ghost just got hope to me, and so I took that little money I had and I ran down the store and got some this and some neck bone and so forth and so on, and took it to the house. Thank you, Jesus. Ain't God good? I'm like, that's a testimony. You know, that, that, that's a telling somebody how good you are and how bad somebody else was. So I cut out testifying. No, y'all ain't testifying no more. Because <laughs> that won't testify. That was what? You did it, but you did it so you could get credit for it. And that's what he's you know, talking about, is that you want to do it because it's in your heart. Do it not because somebody else is going to give you credit. God's going to give you credit. Let God give you the credit. Let him take care of you and move on. Right? Do it because you want to help somebody. Right? That's why it says, look not. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And that, you know, when you think about that in a practical standpoint, right, and how great that benefit is, right, because most, of, most people, what they look for is how they can be served and not how they can serve, right? Most people look at what, what can be done for them and not what they can do for somebody else. And so, you know, we, this is what we say. You, you know, we, we sing this little, we, we're used to, we don't sing it much anymore. We used to sing this, you know, when we do the offering, right? We were saying, you can't beat God giving, right? no matter how hard you try. The more you give, the more he gives to you. So just keep on giving because what? It's really true that you can't be God giving, right? The more you give, the more he gives to you. And then folks would use this, the older preacher would use this old analogy. A closed hand can't get a gift, right? So you gotta open the hand up and give, and leave it open for God to drop some blessing down on it, right? Okay. Am I my brother's keeper is the question. Am I my brother's keeper? Right. Truly, the Lord said what? I am my brother's keeper. Right. So if I am my brother's keeper, then that suggests that I should spend more time worrying about you than I am worrying about myself. Okay? Now, why is that practical? Why is that practical? Yes, but why else is it practical? Because let's say the other person ain't helping you. Because I, I don't help you just because, what, you might help me. But why else is it practical? We just read it. Because that's what God wants you to do, right? Now, if I believe, remember he talked about up front, right, if there be any mercies, if there be any this, if there be any that. He's saying, wait, if you have experienced God's blessings in your life, if you have experienced God taking care of you when you could not take care of yourself, then you ought to know that he's already manifest to you that if you give, as long as you're giving in love, he will always take care of you. If you help out of love for your brother, he will always take care of you. Go ahead and clap one more time back there, man. And that's what he's saying, right? So that's the point that Paul is trying to convey to these people. 
which is the same point that we ought to convey to ourselves. Again, if we are like-minded, right, then that will be our push all the time, right? And again, practical examples, okay? Practical examples. Think about the, the work of the missionaries at Enoch Baptist Church. And think about how few there are out there really in the field doing missionary kind of work. Okay? How many, how many hungry people are we individually looking to feed? Uh, you know, don't raise your hand. I'm not asking you to, you know, show me your hand. I'm just saying, think about it for a minute, right? You know, here's what we know. That in this era of COVID-19, that there has to be a number of members over the age of 70 that would love to have someone say, you know what, until you are comfortable going out the house, I got your back. I'll run this errand for you. I'll make sure this is taken care of for you. Can you imagine how that would, how that would feel to those members that were in that age group? And can you imagine what would happen to word of mouth advertising about the love of Enoch Baptist Church? Can, can, can you imagine? Are y'all imagining it now? <laughs> But I'm, you know, I'm not saying if any of us are bad people. I understand that's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying if 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 we all were like-minded and thought that way, you know, as soon as the, as soon as COVID hit, the phones would have been ringing off the hook, saying, "Hey, you know what? What can I do? How can I help? Well, how can I do this? How can I do that?" But but that's not how we have been taught to think, and so because of that, our first thought is always. Well, I ain't going out there and get COVID-19. They ain't nothing dead for nobody. Right? But that's not what Paul is saying how we ought to think. Our first thought should be about how we're going to help somebody, knowing that God will take care of us. Now, I'm not saying take your mask off and go visit nobody. All right? They expect God to take care of you. Why? Because the Bible says what? Tempt not the Lord thy God. Right? But that don't mean we could not, as a unit, you know, demonstrate that to people. Okay? All right. So, we got time for a little bit more. So then in verse 5, I'm going to hang there for a while till we close out for the night. So he says, Therefore, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And then the next verses kind of give the, 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 where he's coming from with what that mind is. Okay? If you look at verses 6, seven and eight, that really is like he's saying, this is, this is characteristic of the mind of Christ. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to take you away from that just for a minute and just talk about the mind of Christ. So, so we can just have a discussion about the mind of Christ. Because he says, what? Let this mind be in you, which also is in Christ Jesus. Right? So what is the this mind? To know the mind, because three verses is not going to give you enough, is it? That's just three short examples. So the question then it becomes is, well, what was, what was the mind of Christ? What was Christ thinking? What was the demeanor of Christ? What was Christ's purpose? If I'm going to have the mind of Christ, I must know his purpose. I must know how he thinks. I must know why he does what he does, what his end game ought to be, if I'm going to have that kind of a mindset, right? So what is the mind of Christ? What was his thinking? To what? Right? Well, I say it a little differently, but I know what you're saying, right? You're saying it the way that we always teach, preach it, right? And I'll say this, not because I'm not saying you're wrong, but because I want people to get away from the, you know, the kind of the old colloquialisms and really get down to the nitty gritty, right? We say he came to seek and save those that were lost, right? Well, didn't he already know who we were? So he really didn't come to seek them because he didn't look for them. How did he know I was lost? Hmm? 
because I was born. That's how he knew I was lost, because I was born, right? <laughs> he already knew what? Man born of a woman. Born in sin. That's what, isn't that what the Bible said? You're born in sin and shaped by iniquity. So we all were born sinners, right? So he knew we was, so he, he came what? That we, John 3, 16. Why did he come? That what? So he didn't come to seek, the, but to give a method that we might be saved, right? He came to give a method that we might be saved. That was his purpose, right? So, his, so if, if his purpose was to create a method for us to be saved, was there already a method out there for mankind to become in a right standing with God? Come on. Give me to me. You come on in. My party girl, come on, give me to me. Was there a method already out there? Shannon, help her out. Was there already a method out there? Huh? Yeah, before Christ. Wait, 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 wait you're right. <laughs> Go ahead, say it again. Yes, I said before Christ. Why? You, okay, if, if she said no and I said help her out, what that mean? No, no, before, okay, back up. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let, let me help you out real fast, it was 8 o'clock. The Mosaic Law gave you what? What you needed to do to obtain a right standing with God. If you did this wrong, do this sin. Even if you did this sin, I'm sorry. Do this offering. If you did this sin, give this offering. Right? Right? All the dispensations had something like that, right? Even the age of innocence, we talked about that. Maybe that's what you guys, but age of innocence, all you know, all this kind of stuff we've talked about, right? That's why I went to you guys, because y'all you had this before. So we know that there was always already a methodology there, right? Which is easier? Following the law or following grace? And had a kick in the head. Think about the mind. Of, again, we think about what? What is the mind of Christ? The first way was difficult. Right? It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to do all that sacrifice and stuff. Burnt offerings and all this kind of stuff. It wasn't easy. The second way was easy. So what does the mind of Christ tell you? Based on that one concept. Huh? Right, I just told you. He's trying to help you any way he can. Why? Because he became your sacrifice. So his mindset was this, what? I'm not thinking about myself. Who am I thinking about? I'm thinking about you. Because I'm willing to sacrifice me for you. Because I could have kept it like I had it, right? I could have kept, you, you could have you been bringing uh, 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 two turtle doves down here tonight. Right? Because somebody lied today and they need to bring them turtle doves down here so we can get that out of their system, right? Right? Somebody could have been bringing a lamb down here right now, right? But he said, no, I'm going to forgive you if you want, accept me as your Lord and Savior. So his mindset was, I want to make it easy for you. I want to make it easy for you. Think about that. If I got his mind, I want to make it easy for you. But that ain't what we do to people. We make it more difficult for him. That ain't what he did. That's what I'm saying. That sometimes, sometimes get away from the, you know, the, the, all the colloquial, the stuff that preachers say just to make you know them, you know, give some vain glory. But just look at the reality of what he did, right? His mindset was what? Judge not, lest ye be judged. He said what? A man, a, a man of what? Humility. That was his mindset. What? I don't need to walk around telling y'all that I'm great. Because that ain't why I came. I ain't come to tell you how great I was. I came to help you get where you, where you need to go. 
right? I'm just saying, so when he said, when he said, let this mind be in you, you can't let his mind, you can't think like, you cannot get where you need to go unless you understand the mindset of Christ. Not, not, not just the quoting of the scripture, but the mindset of him, how he thought and his purpose and plan. Okay? All right, now if you read uh, verses 6, 7, and 8, those three verses kind of give you a, 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 a real brief overview of the traits of his mindset, okay? But we're going to stop right there, okay? And we're going to pick it up at verse 6. Okay? And if there are no questions, then we're going to go ahead and dismiss you, okay? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you tonight for your word. I want to thank you for every saint that is here on tonight. And I pray, God, that you would look upon each of us, Lord, give us the understanding that we need so that we can receive your mind through the Holy Spirit, that we can step out and represent you in a way that you get the glory. See us safely, Father, to our appointed destinations until such time as we meet again. Amen. All right. God bless you. Have a good night. Thank you. See your son to praise. See, that's the mind of Christ. Praise the Lord. Forsake not the ascending of the saints. <laughs>